Hello, welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Alexey Petrenko, and uh, today I'll tell you about our latest, latest project called Sample Factory, which was presented at ICML this year. And this is a bit of an unusual reinforcement learning talk because I will not cover the usual topics of performance at convergence or sample efficiency, but rather I will discuss computational performance of reinforcement learning systems. I will start by talking about training and simulation. This is kind of an obvious topic, but we got to start somewhere. And uh, of course, the kind of end goal of reinforcement learning research of artificial intelligence research is to deploy these intelligent policies on real robots, on real agents that behave in, in real world environments. But unfortunately, we currently cannot train these agents uh, directly in real world. First of all, because our existing reinforcement learning methods are extremely simple and efficient. So it will take uh, a long time to, to train anything non-trivial. Uh, additionally, these methods are not safe. Sometimes they can break the robot if they don't know what they're doing uh, in the beginning. Uh, so fortunately, we have this amazing tool, which is simulation. Uh, with modern simulators, we can, we can emulate a lot of aspects of uh, these real world tasks uh, with, with high fidelity. Uh, and uh, of course, we can run simulation and training in simulation a lot faster, orders of magnitude faster than we can train uh, agents in real world directly. Moreover, if we are interested in one day developing agents that are generally useful, that has this right general uh, reasoning ability applicable across multiple domains, we got to be able to train these agents in complex environments that require a lot of non-trivial decision making, uh, that have non-trivial uh, observation and action spaces, and so on. Uh, and there is evidence that uh, this is where the frontier lies in reinforcement learning. All the most amazing results from the recent years came from precisely this area of research, training uh, agents on a lot of samples in uh, complex and interesting environments, uh, such, such as uh, environments shown on the right. Unfortunately, to actually do that, to train these agents to interesting non-trivial performance or to do some state-of-the-art sort of research in these environments, you need a lot of samples. You need a lot of data collected from these environments. And this usually means scaling. This usually means running reinforcement learning experiments at large scale. It's great if you are a big company or if you are an industrial research lab, you probably have access to uh, a supercomputer cluster. Uh, for a wider research community, this is generally not the case. Your average uh, PhD student or a researcher in university uh, typically has a lot less compute available to them. So is there another way? Can we do something to uh, enable this interesting state-of-the-art experiments and results uh, without requiring a supercomputer cluster? Can we uh, somehow modify our training systems, our approach to training uh, to just uh, be more efficient, uh, to squeeze more performance out of the existing hardware that we have. Uh, this, is, this is what this talk is about. We will start by examining the existing architectures of reinforcement learning algorithms. In particular, I will cover uh, policy gradient or what they call own policy methods uh, in this talk. So the most standard way to implement on policy reinforcement learning has acquired this name A2C for uh, advantage actor critic in the literature. And it is a very, actually a very good method. It has a lot of, it has a lot of positive uh, traits to it. It's very easy to implement. There is usually no communication cost. I mean, depends on how you implement it, but usually all uh, of the data is gathered and used uh, within the boundaries of the same process. 
So it's very easy to just share all the data between all the components. Uh, and uh, on, also on top of that, the experience that you collect is usually exactly on policy, uh, which means that you collect the experience uh, with the same policy that uh, you are training. There is, there, is no, there is no difference. The policy that collects uh, the experience is, is always the same policy uh, as the policy that's being trained on the collected experience. So what are the disadvantages? Why can't we just uh, use this most popular, straightforward implementation of, of uh, on policy RL? So first of all, note that uh, time, this timeline diagrams on the right show that this process, this training process is very sequential. Uh, you, can, you can see that there are three distinct computational steps, which is environment simulation, uh, forward pass through the uh, neural network to generate actions, and then backward pass for uh, learning for generating parameter updates, and they're all sequential. Uh, so in case we are using different resources, or in case we are using the same resource but at a different uh, capacity uh, for these three computational steps, uh, we will not be able to interleave them on, or, or overlay them. Uh, they are inherently sequential. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, with uh, strategy A, uh, which is the most common strategy, you, you can see that, uh, let's say, if we use GPU for the forward pass and for the backward pass, then GPU doesn't do anything most of the time. Uh, then again, if the simulation step is not exactly uniform, then even uh, most of the CPU cores, uh, I mean, of course, if we do simulation on CPU, don't do anything most of the time. Uh, so of course this is this is very inefficient. Uh, spoiler alert: we can do a lot better than this. So uh, there's been uh, many attempts. Uh, this is there actually this quest for performance and reinforcement learning has been ongoing for uh, several years since the beginning of this new field of deep RL, uh, and there's been a lot of attempts to solve these uh, computational disadvantages of the uh, the most standard naive approach. And one of the first works was this A3C algorithm, uh, stands for asynchronous advantage actor critic. And uh, it solves, it's, it partially solves this problem of, uh, of the fact that the components of the algorithm are sequential and we cannot fully utilize resources of let's say big server, uh, let alone multiple, multiple uh, machines. Uh, so what we are doing is we are creating these actor uh, processes and each process uh, has uh, its own instance of the simulator, its own instance of a neural network uh, that we generate actions with and uh, its, own, its own learner. So essentially this little uh, actor here is, encompasses the entire A to C and then uh, it generates its own experience. It, uh, generates its own actions and it trains on its own experience and then uh, updates its local parameters or as a sense the parameter updates to the central parameter server and uh, and the, this algorithm proceeds in this fashion so it's it's great because now we can uh, scale these algorithms really well we can basically spawn as many processes as we have uh, available resources, whatever they are, CPU cores, most of the time in this case. Uh, but there are a lot of disadvantages to doing this as well. So first of all, uh, we gain a lot of performance in uh, any sort of machine learning from batching, from doing uh, operations on tensors in big batches, be it uh, inference or uh, learning. And because we have, we want to have this many of these actor processes, we cannot have uh, large batches here. So the, the batches for backpropagation and for inference are very small, and we lose a lot of a lot of performance here. Uh, and also, uh, we uh, introduce a lot of communication overhead. Now we have to send these parameters back and forth to the parameter server. Uh, this doesn't scale well to big models. I mean, obviously. As your parameter vector grows, uh, it can be tens of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes. Uh, it gets really difficult to send this back and forth, especially if you have many processes, especially if it's a cross network. 
and uh, it also learning can be very unstable. It's uh, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of feedback about A3C in particular, how difficult it is to train. Uh, the problem is that uh, the policy network that you have on the actors is not the same one uh, as in the master parameter server. So when you generate the gradients for the version of the policy uh, that collected the experience, we call it the behavior policy. Uh, by that time, uh, several parameter updates may have arrived on the parameter server from other actors, and the, the gradients uh, do not apply. Uh, the gradients were not calculated for the version uh, on the parameter server. Uh, and uh, the more kind of lag you have, the worse it is. So it's, it, it becomes very uh, tricky to balance this training algorithm and to tune the hyperparameters such that it can attain high performance and learn stable in a stable way. The next uh, big step in uh, developing these architectures uh, was this work on a uh, family of algorithms called Impala. Uh, this, I think, stands for importance weighted actor learner architectures. So from the computational point of view, these uh, these people recognized uh, this like sequential nature of these uh, training systems, uh, and they tried to decouple at least some components uh, into into different processes uh, to take advantage of batching and take advantage of uh, parallelism of modern computers. So you still have a lot of actor processes, and each one of them has the instance of the simulator, and each one of them has the instance of the neural networks that generates the actions. But the learner now is a different process. Uh, so uh, as you can see, the back propagation step on the learner here is done in big batches and it's done in a centralized way. And instead of sending the parameters around like in a previous architecture, instead you're collecting this experience trajectories on actors and then you send them to the, to the learner. And, um, learner calculates the parameters in a centralized way. Uh, whether this is more efficient in, in terms of communication than sending parameters depends on the particular task, depends on the particular uh, environment and the particular architecture of the neural network. But uh, the main thing here is the decoupling of uh, learning and experience collection. So you can do both at the same time. Uh, so let's say we have a bunch of trajectories from different actors that arrived on the learner. We can start the back propagation. And while we are doing this, uh, these actors continue uh, collecting the experience. So there is no downtime. We can, we can utilize our resources more efficiently. Uh, but of course, this is still not optimal. As you can see, a lot of, uh, a lot of workloads here are still sequential. So on the actors, we are either co collecting environment uh, we are either calculating the environment step or the forward pass, uh, and also on the actors, uh, the batch uh, sizes are really small generally. Although uh, there is a version of this algorithm with uh, centralized inference as well. So there are lots of other works in this area, of course, but uh, considering these uh, is kind of enough to, to spot the obvious performance bottlenecks of most of uh, these types of the systems. Uh, so first performance bottleneck, as I mentioned, uh, since we have three uh, different work main workloads in RL, which is simulation, inference, and backpropagation, uh, and the overall performance of the system will, of course, depends on the will, of course, depend on the slowest one of these uh, processes. It it makes sense to give it like as much computational resources as we have and make sure that. Uh, the CPU cores, let's say, if it's simulation, uh, that makes sure the CPU cores are never idle, they're always doing something. Uh, and in existing methods, uh, these computational workloads are dependent. So one has to wait for another uh, to finish, especially this is the case for experience collection. Uh, so of course, we need to wait for, uh, to act for actions to be generated before we can generate the next, before we can uh, collect the next uh, frame of the experience. Um, and uh, second bottleneck is communication. So a lot of these uh, frameworks and uh, systems that's been proposed in the literature, they were developed with distributed training in mind because usually they come from uh, well-established uh, 
research labs such as uh, DeepMind, OpenAI that have a lot of resources and uh, this is the problem they are solving, how to scale these algorithms to uh, the big uh, clusters that they have. Uh, but uh, because of that, they have a lot of overhead on, on um, serialization. So let's say if you have multiple components like an Impala and you need to communicate this experience trajectories back and forth, you need to serialize them, deserialize them. And uh, this is a lot of, of work that is not spent on actually doing the thing that we care about. So uh, what can we do about it? Uh, we can develop uh, a new algorithm that tries to work around these issues. Uh, we call it the sample factory, or as a sample factory is the name of the training system. Uh, in this particular publication, we uh, implemented uh, an asynchronous version of PPO uh, with the system, although it can be used uh, for other on policy algorithms as well. And uh, so from the architecture point of view, uh, to uh, address this issue, we, uh, we have three distinct uh, types of components. Each one is associated uh, with the particular type of computational workload. So for the environment simulation, we have a distinct dedicated component, uh, set family of components called rollout workers. Uh, we have uh, policy workers that do the inference, and we have uh, dedicated learners that ju just does the learning. So as you can see, uh, we, we had this goal we had this idea that we need to decouple these computational workloads and this uh, this is achieved by uh, splitting each one of them into several components uh, but i mean from the from just this picture of the architecture it's not clear how how this solves any problems like for example it seems like the experience collection is still completely sequential right so you need uh, to generate the actions before you can uh, feed these actions to the simulator and, and generate the next uh, observation so uh, to optimize this, we uh, came up with this thing called double buffered sampling. So basically this allow us, allows us to uh, overlay uh, these two processes in time. So th this timeline diagram shows how this works. Uh, so in blue, uh, we show the rollout worker step, this is Typically, something executed on a CPU, let's say you have your Atari environment or whatever, uh, and you use uh, CPU for simulation. Uh, this is the normal process. So your CPU waits uh, and it's idle uh, for the duration that uh, it takes uh, for inference uh, to generate the next action, et cetera, et cetera. So what we propose is to have, uh, is to have two sets of environments instead. And while uh, we are generating actions for the second uh, set of sets of these environments, uh, we can already generate uh, actions for the first set of environments. And by the time the second set of environments uh, finish their simulation, we already have the actions to continue the simulation of the first part of the, of the set of environments. Uh, the, the way it's implemented in Sample Factory is uh, on every CPU core, uh, we host uh, an even number, more than two, uh, of uh, simulators and the first half of these uh, simulators is, is being simulated first. Uh, then we send all these observations uh, to the inference worker with, uh, uh, and while it's generating the action for the next uh, step of the simulation, we simulate the second uh, half of these simulators. This is a very basic idea, it comes from computer graphics. Uh, you have like this double buffered rendering. It's basically the same idea to interleave uh, displaying something on a screen. And while you're doing this, you can uh, render the next frame. So this way we can continuously sample the environments and do the inference and backdrop in the background. Uh, and for example, if our environments are CPU bound, uh, this will allow us to achieve 100% uh, CPU utilization on our rollout workers, achieving maximum performance from the system. <clears throat> so second bottleneck uh, in uh, these systems is, as I mentioned, communication. Uh, and uh, usually this comes from the need to send the information between the processes. And as I mentioned, uh, since we are mostly focused on the 
lower budget setups so like a single server we can actually avoid most of that by by, by just noticing the fact that uh, all of that information all of the data uh, in reinforcement learning is uh, stored in static data structures so let's say uh, usually we don't change most of the parameters of training during during training things like uh, resolution of the observation uh, if it's an image or length of the rollout or the number of workers that we have etc cetera, etc cetera. so we can just allocate all this um, shared memory and just share it between the processes uh, in this particular implementation it is done uh, using pytorch shared tensors uh, and what it allows us to do is uh, we, we actually never uh, serialize any data we just uh, write uh, the relevant information into a predefined location, let's say a trajectory of observations. And uh, through this uh, through the queues, we can just send the indices in the arrays that uh, all the other processes already have. And this massively speeds up the communication uh, because otherwise at full throttle, uh, this algorithm uh, collects about one gigabyte of information per second or maybe even more than that. And serializing this in any way is even the fastest serializer would be would kill the performance. So we just avoid uh, doing this completely. And the uh, same is achieved for for the model weights. Uh, so uh, in in our system, uh, the learner and uh, policy workers for the same policy live on the same GPU. So they can just store the copy of their parameters in uh, GPU memory and they both access it. So again, the, there is no need to send the parameters around between processes in any way. They can access it at all times. Uh, and another uh, thing that is great about this architecture is uh, it's, it's very easy to extend. So let me point out that rollout workers are completely agnostic of where, where the experience is coming from. Uh, so, as you can see, they just consume the actions and spit out the observations. That's all that uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, what it allows us to do is to, uh, let's say, have multi-agent environments and have multiple policies training at the same time. And uh, so, let's say, you can have things like self-play or you can have things like population-based training in multi-agent environments. And it's very, very easy to do with sample factory. So basically, uh, on the rollout worker, we have a multi-agent environment. And some of the agents come from uh, first policy. Some of the agents are controlled by the second policy, et cetera, et cetera. And so when it's time to request the actions for the next uh, step of simulation, uh, the rollout workers just send this request to different queues uh, that address uh, different policy workers uh, associated with different policies. The only thing that we need to change is now we have multiple learners, essentially. That's the only change uh, in the architecture that allows uh, things like population-based training. Um, okay, let me uh, now talk about some results. Uh, so these are comparisons with uh, existing implementations of on-policy reinforcement learning. In particular, of course, we were interested in uh, other implementations that focused on performance. So we, we are, of course, not the first people who wanted to make a reinforcement learning, learning training as fast as possible. And uh, so we, are, we compared to DeepMind implementation of Impala, the algorithm that I mentioned. Uh, we compared to the same algorithm implemented in RLLib. Uh, we compared to latest uh, DeepMind framework called uh, Vtrace, uh, called CDRL, I'm sorry, called CDRL. Uh, that actually uh, uses some of the similar ideas uh, that we used. And uh, the fastest uh, implementation that was available at the time of submission is uh, this framework called RLPyte from Berkeley. Uh, very, very good implementation. And as you can see, uh, our algorithm outperforms all of them by a substantial amount on all of the environments that we tested, uh, in particular in environments like Atari or Wisdom, uh, we are about twice, two times faster than the than RLPy, than the fastest baseline we have, and uh, several times faster, at least four times faster than uh, CDRL, the latest and greatest algorithm from DeepMind. 
and uh, another uh, data point to support my claim. Uh, we uh, conducted these experiments. So basically, what you want when you're trying to achieve higher computational performance in these algorithms is to not lose sample efficiency because it's just very easy to increase uh, batch sizes to crazy amounts and uh, completely destroy the training performance. So of course we want to preserve the sample efficiency as a uh, so basically the computational performance comes for free. The, your experiments are just faster. So this is a comparison of CDRL uh, versus Sample Factory. Uh, on the same uh, on the same two environments, we basically trained them to convergence. And as you can see, this is the, the normal plot uh, that displays average uh, reward per uh, some amount of environment frames, in this case, up to 100 million environment frames. Uh, so these algorithms, do, uh, they exhibit a very similar sample efficiency, I would say. Uh, but as, uh, if you plot the actual training time and minutes on x-axis, you can see a completely different picture. So by the time, uh, by the time the CDRL uh, just starting to train, we are kind of ready to converge and finish the experiment. So this is actually huge. If you're doing the reinforcement learning research, having this huge decrease in turnaround time uh, of your experiments allows you to to test ideas a lot faster, to train, to test different reward functions a lot faster, to uh, do larger hyperparameter sweeps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this is generally beneficial for research in many ways. Another interesting piece of analysis that we did, um, it's called performance upper bound here. Uh, it's not any sort of theoretical upper bound, it's also empirical. Basically, we uh, stripped out everything that we could from sample factories such as action generation and learning and uh, this leaves us with pure sampler. Uh, so we are just sampling these environments, these three types of environments that we tested uh, using uh, this, using random actions essentially, no learning, uh, no nothing, just using all of the resources of the machine to just sample the environment, do nothing else. And we uh, get these numbers. So uh, on this uh, 36 core uh, Zion server, uh, we can get 180,000 frames per second in Atari, 300,000 in Doom, uh, about 50,000 frames per second in uh, DM Lab. And uh, so this is a theoretical maximum of performance uh, that the training system can have. And as you can see, uh, Sample Factory comes a lot closer to this theoretical limit uh, in terms of training performance uh, than any other algorithm that we tested. And uh, very, very close actually on DM Lab because the environment simulation is heavy for DM Lab. Uh, therefore, all the other components uh, don't have that much of an effect. But uh, look at how far we are still uh, to the theoretical performance in Wisdom. So maybe uh, there is even further uh, potential for improvement for these systems. So, how do you make sense of these numbers? How fast? it actually is and uh, what can you do with this uh, new performance regime that we kind of unlocked. So on a, on a 36 core, uh, as I mentioned, we achieve something like 130, 140,000 frames per second of training in Wisdom, depending on the scenario, depending on the settings and resolution. Uh, so what does it mean? And it means that in, in one hour of uh, in one second of training, we collect and train on an hour of subjective experience. Like if if a human sat down and played the game for an hour, in uh, one day of training, we train on ten years of uh, experience, and in one week on about seventy one years or seventy eight billion samples of uh, experience per second. So what can you do if you have access to so many samples? and you don't need a cluster, you can train some pretty amazing policies and set some uh, new state-of-the-art benchmarks. So this is exactly what we did. Uh, we tested, uh, we particularly like the Wisdom environment because it's kind of more challenging than Atari. It's 3D, it's all pixel-based. 
So uh, what you can see on the right is the performance of the agent uh, playing in real time. So this is not uh, sped up in any way. And the agent only gets the pixel observations and outputs the, the keystrokes, essentially, exactly how a human would play. Uh, and we set a new uh, we set a new performance benchmarks in these environments, and this is actually pretty much superhuman performance. I myself uh, tried to beat this agent, and uh, I'm not the worst uh, shooter player in the world, and I just couldn't. Uh, these agents are pretty much perfect. So this is a, a little bit more interesting type of environment. So we went ahead and um, put our agent in an actual death match. In this case, it's uh, against the bots. So this is a uh, death match with eight players and the agent plays against seven other uh, agents that are scripted in-game bots. So they have access to all the in-game information. They know where the enemies are, they know how to aim. Uh, and our agent only has pixel observations of this world. And as you can see on the left, uh, so the plots show that it defeats the scripted opponents with like a devastating score. Uh, so of course it wins 100% of the matches on, on the highest difficulty uh, that you can set for the bots in this game. And uh, I, I think on this eight agent death match, it achieves uh, something like eight times more uh, frags, more uh, points more, uh, on average than, uh, than the average bot. And also we did the same experiment with one v one scenario, so where the agent plays against a scripted, um, also a scripted opponent, and similar results at the choose around like thirty five uh, points uh, versus five points on average for the bot. And like the ultimate setup, as I as I mentioned, one of the bigger advantages of Sample Factory is how easy you can manifest all these different training regimes, multi agent self play, population based training. So we went ahead and we actually set up the actual multiplayer Doom game. Uh, this involves two instances of the game connecting to each other over the local network like you would in a uh, real multiplayer match and the agents play against each other. Uh, so the, the opponent of our agent here is the same agent. And uh, so we, we, we trained this for quite some time, uh, I think about uh, 20 billion uh, time steps uh, or in-game frames, simulation steps of the game world. And we see that these agents ex exhibit pretty interesting performance. Uh, they basically learn to do everything there is to do in this game, uh, collect weapons, they change the weapons, uh, they open doors, they even access this like secret door sometimes to get a more powerful weapon. They try to sneak upon uh, each other, uh, they spawn camp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, another interesting result is that we also, as I mentioned, we also had the same uh, experiment with uh, the scripted bots and the, the agent played, uh, the agent trained with self-play consistently outperforms uh, the agent trained against the bots because it was trained with population-based training, this population of eight different agents training at the same time. And it was just exposed to a better, more diverse mix of mix of adversaries and developed more interesting behaviors. So we then we matched uh, this agent trained against the bots versus the agent trained with self-play and it, and it won in 77% of the matches and with 20% uh, tie, so it basically never loses. To further confirm the uh, usefulness of these types of uh, RL systems, we also went ahead, uh, went ahead and uh, trained uh, our agent on DMLab30 benchmark. Some of you might know this is a this is a benchmark from DeepLab uh, from DeepMind uh, for like multitask learning. Essentially, the goal is to train a single agent on to solve 30 different tasks in in 30 different environments. And this uh, this has been a big, big deal. They kind of used this Impala system for this at first, and they uh, trained it on a cluster. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many, but like many, many GPUs, many, many CPU cores. And we basically do the same thing, 
on a single node. Uh, we trained this uh, DM Lab 30 uh, with population based training uh, on 10 billion time steps to population size of four on a single node in about two weeks. And we actually outperformed DeepMind uh, result uh, by a few percentage points. Uh, yeah, so now you can do this crazy experiments where you can train agent to solve 30 different problems uh, to great performance on a single node. So you don't, you don't even need the cluster. And it goes beyond that. Uh, it goes beyond this like pixel based environments. Now my colleagues and I, we are using this uh, algorithm, this system to uh, train quadrotor swarms. So completely unrelated to everything you've seen before. This is not a pixel based environment. This uh, observations here are uh, of course vectors of like positions, velocities, rotation matrices, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, so this is a simulator with uh, high fidelity, realistic uh, uh, quadrotor dynamics. And yeah, we train this like multi-agent swarms uh, to solve uh, some interesting problems. This is uh, just a teaser uh, for the future project. Okay, so my talk is pretty much over. Uh, maybe if I have a couple more minutes, I would like to banter a little bit about the broader impact of, of this kind of research, why, why, that, why I think this is important, maybe a little bit more important than just speeding up experiments. Uh, so of course, like making RL research accessible and democratizing it is, is, is great and it's good for the field and we should do this. Uh, and the performance of a single node as we presented is also very important for the multi-node setups. So of course, uh, if you have a cluster, you want to, to be as efficient as possible on every single node in this cluster. Uh, I mean, that goes without saying, but also uh, it, this new optimized systems, they can open up completely new performance regimes that will just allow us to solve, to start solving a different type of problem. Uh, in maybe even uh, several years ago, even training anything on let's say a pixel based, uh, image based environment like Atari to convergence was a big deal and uh, was considered like a, a big undertaking. But the systems like this on, on the most simple uh, wisdom environment, uh, environments, we have convergence of policy in one minute, in one minute of real time, uh, we can solve, we can train something from scratch to doing something a little bit intelligent, right? So maybe uh, we can now have this entire training sessions in some other training loop. Let's say we have some meta learner or uh, some entity that learns how to learn, or if it's reinforcement learning that learns how to explore. Uh, I think this is very important because uh, the current state of the field kind of reminds me of uh, computer vision in the 90s, where people went from uh, handcrafted features and algorithms to uh, learning everything. Uh, and this eventually led to deep learning. Now we, uh, we, uh, we managed to develop this algorithm that can learn features very well uh, and uh, they can solve uh, amazing computer vision problems. Uh, but in reinforcement learning and learning how to act, we still rely on very, very crude, uh, basically handcrafted rule-based algorithms for learning and for exploration for that matter. Uh, so we have our policy gradients, which is, is kind of a very simple thing if you think about it. And exploration, usually what you do is at this entropy term, uh, this is definitely not the best we can do. If you could, if you had access to a lot of traces of uh, different learning sessions. Maybe you can learn better ways to learn uh, or to explore. So this is just a huge speculation, but one of the things that you need to, to start doing this is to be able to train something very, very quickly. So you can have a single iteration of training inside another training loop. So yeah. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Goodbye.